بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم احمده واصلي على رسول الكريم اما بعد uh, so we are very very happy alhamdulillah today to have a special guest mona abdul latif is here and uh, this is a brother that he is a brother of istiqama okay he is uh, shown himself to be a man that uh, he'll keep pushing forward whether someone's with him or not with him he doesn't care he's just going to do his thing and so that's a quality that uh, is lacking in uh, many of the uh, muslims in general also uh, so, uh, Brother uh, Mawlana Abdul Latif, uh, should we get straight to the topic, inshallah? Or should, uh, do you want to introduce yourself, maybe? Alhamdulillah, I think you've said enough. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so, um, you're in England, mashallah, uh, yes. and you do teach uh, traditional Islamic studies. And yes. uh, you have a broad range of issues that you deal with. Everything from the current situation we're in, uh, which I can't talk about in YouTube, by the way, um, or, or if I upload it to my YouTube video, I can't. Um, they'll censor me, and I'm on my last strike, by the way. So, okay. so we're going to talk about manhood, which is another one of those topics that is included in your broad range of view in what the ummah has to do to revive itself, which is really, you know, one of the most, I think people don't look at things from the perspective of what do we need to do to revive this ummah? Everything, everyone looks at things from an issue of mas'ala. What is this mas'ala and what is that mas'ala? And it's fragmented. And very few people think from the perspective of ahya alum of deen, of what will, what are the sciences to revive Islam? And uh, so, uh, I will let Brother um, Mona Abdul Latif, inshallah, uh, take over now. So we're Zakhla talking Haran. about manhood. So that's the topic. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so basically, um, I mean, there's lots of things we could discuss here um, because the idea of manhood, in, um, or let's say the lack of it, has an impact on everything that a man does. So strictly speaking, we could, you know, <laughs> I mean, we could go through our, society, history, mention a lot of things where the lack of manhood has, its, has had its impact. Um, but I, th I want to be a bit more um, confined uh, with this. I think what I'd like to first um, talk a little bit about is um, why we're in the situation that we're in, what's led to it. And, um, you know, um, from what I've seen and learned about first of all that is we, we have observed that is a distinct lack of manhood what we call um in urdu you know himma uh, um because those qualities come from manhood and um there is a lot of that that is missing and it seems to be getting diminishing diminishing more and more and um on the other hand you've got this push right that's quite evident for this to actually take place. And that push comes in various forms. And uh, one of the forms that I really think, you know, we as a Muslim community, and again, it, it really comes back to the ulama as well. The ulama need to be aware of this and the ulama need to do something about this. And of those issues, the first one, the basic issues, to be honest with you, um, food, mm. food. We know that there is deliberate intent and efforts made to decrease the masculinity through additives and hormones and so on in food. And that's impacting us a lot. There's research done by non-Muslims, independent research, which is talking about this. I mean, the very fact that you put female hormones, estrogens, inside animals, cattle, chickens, in order to fatten them up, so to speak, in order to make give them more commercial value. But then that, that chemical is within that creature, which is then slaughtered, sold to the, um, um, the, the chip shops up and down the country, around the world. Fast food, basically, is what I'm talking about. And it comes out in the basic food. That chemical doesn't break down. There's nothing in the chicken that's going to break it down or in the cattle. So it stays in there. Mm. So we ingest the meat, we ingest the chemical. So that causes problems within us. Then there's the... That the, reminds me that um, 
there was a, a study, uh, when the study happened because they found frogs with male and female genital parts in Potomac Park, Maryland, in, in near Washington, DC. Yeah. And uh, no one ever actually did anything about it, but no one is questioned really like, okay, why are these frogs getting these different, you know, uh, female yeah. uh, parts? And uh, so, so there's, there's no doubt about it. Everything from the water to the food, like you're saying, is definitely affecting us in a very negative way. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, this is, this is deliberate <laughs> and direct. I mean, we know there's things in the atmosphere and there's things in the water, but those are poisons and so on that are generally affecting everybody in, in more or less the same way. I'm talking about, you know, specifically that which is targeting masculinity. Mm. And um, I mean, when, when, when a baby is born, the thing that makes the baby a male or a female at the state of it being a, a fetus it is these chemicals. At a certain point in the development of the fetus into the embryo, into the baby, one of those, we have both, every male and every female has the male and female sac of hormone in them. We all have it. You have it. I have it. We have, you and I have female hormone inside us. Females have male hormone inside them. But at the stage of the baby, one of them is, if you like, switched on. The other remains off. And when that switches on, that's when the, the private parts of the baby develop. Mm. And it, before that, it isn't, it isn't known as a male or a female. And it's these chemicals that then cause the physical development of the male or the female private part in the child, in the baby. Then what happens if for the rest of the life of that person, that remains open? Mm. Okay, that, that chemical, that hormone continues to circulate in the body. And so, and the male part, if it's a baby girl, remains closed and vice versa. And generally speaking, and so what happens is through the, their life, this is, there's a balance of female hormone in a woman or a balance of male hormone in a man. Mm. What is happening with the food industry is they're putting these hormones inside the food that we're eating. As a result of which, it impacts us. Now, when female hormone goes into a male body, it's upsetting the balance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala naturally put there. He put the natural balance in there where the female hormone is contained in the sac. It's not released. It's, it's kept under control. At times, it does have an impact, for example, when a man cries or feels emotional or falls mm. in love, these sorts of things, right? Then there, there is, but that, that it's controlled. It's balanced and controlled. Whereas in the case of ingesting further of the same hormone, it starts to impact the body and upset the balance. Mm. That's one thing it does. The other thing is that a general effect of fatty foods, okay? Now we're talking cakes, chocolate, chips, oily foods, greasy foods, you know, all the mm. usual Pakistanis, you know, pakora, samosa, all these kinds of things, yeah? And putting on weight, right? As soon as you put on weight, and studies have been done on this, and I actually did a presentation on this a year ago. A lot of people don't know this, but as soon as you start putting on weight, this is in the male body, the excess storage of fat, the presence of that fat in the male body actually starts to inhibit the work and the production of testosterone. Mm. It starts to impact that. Mm -hmm. So you've got like a double whammy. On the one hand, you're eating this food which has got the chemical in there in its natural pure form, the, the female estrogens, okay? And that you'll be ingesting them. On the other hand, you've got the fact that you're building up fat inside your body, which is inhibiting your testosterone. So it's like a two-pronged approach and you're caught in the middle. Mm. So what then happens is you've got this weakness of this ghaira, this weakness of this male um, attitude, okay, which then decreases male behavior. So this is what's happening. And then the third attack is this, um, it's, it's social. It's socializing the male into becoming feminine. Right. That, that, that's 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 what's happening. There's a lot of now, um, if you like, I, I've, and I've seen this with let's go. Let's look at the Muslim world. If you listen to a lot of talks about marriage. OK, if you listen to a lot of talks about marriage. You know what you find? You find that the scholars that you who are talking about it when they talk about the responsibility of leadership and decision making in the marriage. There's a lot of this talk about, oh, you've got to go together and discuss things together and make the decision together, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I don't find that in our traditional generations, the Salaf, et cetera. I don't find that in Islamic literature. I don't find that in Quran. I don't find that in Hadith. 
Okay. Mm. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quite clear about it. Uh, the leadership, where it is, who has it, and so on. Uh, in Surah Nisa, I believe, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu uh, billahi min shaitan rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ar-Rijal aqawwamuna ala nisa. Right? Now, in that, you can see that there's a problem because start, people start, in, oh, well, that just means to look after and to take care of and to be good to one another and to share and care and that sort of, it's very poor flowery. But, it, Qawwam comes from Qawwam. This, this is how all systems are operating, where you've got a leadership in there. All communities, organizations, companies, um, governments, whatever, there's one leader. Ummah, one leader. Yeah, there's no business Umma, without Umma. one CEO, right? Right. No, right. no school without one principal. Right, right. So, so now, the most important institution, about, which is the family. Yeah, and when people talk about that, leadership, they, want they talk to, about it this way. Yeah, yeah. they want it. So you're not against the husband taking shura or something like that, but he has to be clear or it has to be right. clear that, you know, he he's taking the responsibility of, of absolutely. absolutely solving the issues or whatever absolutely. the issues yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have that. Rasul Salasam made mashura with his wives about various issues at various times. We're not, that's not the issue here. What I'm talking about is that is not concluded. In fact, what has happened nowadays is guys become very indecisive. The yeah. women are more decisive yes. in their decisions yes. than the brothers are. Yes. Yeah. Now that's partly to do with, with what we're ingesting you know? and socialization. And so it leads into that. And so inevitably, and that's another the thing I want to talk about a bit later on, is where women are starting to come into the role of men. Yeah. Okay. We'll touch on that a bit later, but I just want to sort of get the groundwork. So what happens is that we've got as a as a result of this, we start mm. to feel a little un, uncomfortable. You know, because we're so used to modern um, influence mm. and modern thought that the thought, I mean, I often say to people about the Sahaba, the Salaf, it's very difficult for us to talk about the Salaf today because their mentality was different. And we, we, we can't, mm. you know, we can't understand that. I mean, if you look at the way they were, how they loved each other, we can't talk about that today because of the, you know, the, the LGBT, etc. agenda and all. People start to think that way. You can't even use the way they loved each other, the way they would hold hands or they would uh, give salam to each other after passing, uh, if a tree separated them, they would give salam to each other again. Yeah. They would visit each other, etc. Their language, their terminology with each other, today we, we find, might find that awkward. It's like the, the words such as uh, comrade or gay. Now, mm. these words today have a completely different meaning, yet traditionally in their, in, in their own time, the word comrade meant a friend. Today mm. it means something to do with Russia. Yeah, and yeah. Um, the word gay, at one time, it's still in the dictionary, meant to be happy, to be content. But today it has a different connotation. Do you see yeah. what I mean? So yeah. in that, if, if that can happen within, what, a, a decade or two, in, within the English language itself, what do you think is going to happen over 1,400 years? So when we, when we talk about the Sahaba and look at their behavior, I think we need to be in a particular state before we can actually interpret their behavior and understand their mentality. It's very different. Mm -hmm. you know and we haven't we're losing that we've lost a lot already but we're losing it. so when i talk about manhood and if i talk about it in its true sense it's going to sound uncomfortable mm. it's going to sound uncomfortable mm. very See? good point yeah but that is manhood i'm sorry but that is manhood you know if you look at some of these um you know old old and well um, last 20 years now films about warriors and their behavior right it, 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 very masculine very manly but if such a person today was walking the streets, he would be arrested very quickly for being, you know, offensive to women or something like that. His yeah. attitude, his, you know, he would be, you know, you'd have women's lip on his back. On his back. Yeah, that's Just, such a weird thing, right? It's like this, yeah. this dichotomy that they have in this culture. Yeah. yeah. You know, on the one side, you have the hero and the, and the lady loves him and she'll go all to the ends of the world for him. And then you have the women's liberation movement, the yeah. influence of that. Yeah. Simultaneously, both, you know, yeah. uh, there at the same time. Yeah, I'll come to that as well. I'm going to touch on that as well, inshallah. But the next thing, uh, the, the next impact is from the LGBT movement. Okay. And that is where it's clearly, physically, the lines are blurred. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can become a woman, you can become a man, you can, you're, you could be a man trapped in a woman's body, you could be a woman trapped in a man's body, and so you've got to come out uh, and you've got to express yourself and so on. So when that's been made easy, 
And uh, what's happening now is as a result of that, that, um, you know, as you know, we have this changeover. And then you've got this whole new philosophy, which is completely um, illogical. You've got this illogical philosophy that if I feel like I'm a woman and I identify as a woman, I can go to the ladies' toilet. Yeah. I mean, this is without it's any. It's no operation. longer biological now. Yeah. It's all just cognitive. Well, if yeah. you feel that way, then that's what you are. Right. So, and that's come into play. And alongside with that is the part of what's going on in the food as well is this there are chemicals that are now actually impacting and causing gender confusion. So you've got your philosophy, you've got your socialization, you've got your um, food, uh, uh, chemicals, it's physically going into your biology, you're, you're, you're basically so much against you. Mm -hmm. It's almost, it's almost, um, it's a bit, it is an upheld struggle to actually hold on to being a man in this day and age. Mm. Right. And finally, you've actually got women, right? Women who are now complaining about the lack of manhood in their men. Yeah. Okay. Because it, 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 it finally it impacts them. It impacts them because being a man, you see, being a father doesn't impact manhood. Being a brother, being a, you know an imam, being a, a leader, being um, a, a, a CEO, etc., etc., because those are functions and they have particular things, and you fulfil those duties fine. But in terms of your um, your actual male behaviour, your masculinity, that's when that comes out when you're relating or dealing with women. Okay. Um. So, for example. In marriage, that's the classic example. In marriage, you are expected to be manly, masculine. And where that is lacking, women are themselves noticing it. So women themselves are then pointing this out that he's not masculine enough, he's not man enough, etc., etc. And men themselves are actually getting um, demonized or criticized by their immediate women who are saying, you're not man enough, or, you know, where's your courage, where's your gaira, et cetera, et cetera. That's also uh, an impact, really, upon the men, because it makes them feel more insecure. It makes them feel more insecure. If you look at the if Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came down from the uh, cave, when he had the first revelation, he went to Khadija, anha. how was she behaving towards him? Did she say, come on, man up now, what's the matter with you? Why are you crying? Mm. What, what, what are you scared of an angel for? No, she didn't do that. She didn't mock him. Mm. She encouraged him. She reminded him of his strengths and his achievements. She said, you're honest. People believe in you. You're respectable. You've done this and this and this. Allah would never do this to you. Yeah. So there yeah. was no aim, uh, emasculation. There was no like, right. emasculating. Exactly. Me. Yeah. So our sisters have to understand that they, they have to support their men because uh, the, the men are actually under attack. Right. And it's important to the powers that be that they do this because they have to remove men. And once men are gone, masculinity is gone, then the real target is women. Yeah. And their children. It was women. Yeah. Remove their protection and then they're, they're, they're vulnerable. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly what Pharaoh did. Remove the men. And you leave the baby girls, you've got the women. The women are defenseless. You can use them for the sex industry. You can use them for the pornography industry. You can use them for, you know, uh, trafficking, etc., etc. Because there's no man to stop them. There's no man to stand up for that woman and have the ghayra. So there's two ways to do it. Either you kill off all men, which is not going to happen. That's not going to be, uh, you know, uh, throughout history, it's not been done. It's been attempted, but it's not done. Or you can emasculate them. Yeah. Remove their manhood. And then they become useless. And that's what's happening. Now, we were talking earlier about, um, uh, sorry, media is another one I need to, need to mention. Media has a major impact too. Yeah, and I, I wanted to say media, also some things about the educational system, but uh, let's talk I'll, about the media first. I'll come to that in a bit, in a bit, inshallah. The media, you see, I don't know if you, well, I'm sure people have noticed, but in the last maybe 20 years now, 20, 30 years, there's been a shift of male hero figures to female hero figures. Mm. Okay. And um, there's something very clever being done within that as well. Very cunning, but I'll come to that in a minute. You've, so you've got this shift. Now you've got these female, if you notice in the last 20 years, female, uh, there's lots more tough females, if you like, you know, 
uh, superhero movies, you've got superhero, you know, obviously you know about Wonder Woman and the, the and Avengers and so on. You've got all these characters where the females are very strong. They're very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And what's, what that is doing is obviously pushing the women. You, you've had this, you know, various movies now with, with just women as lead roles as well. Right. Um, and what's happening is it's empowering women. It's empowering women. And as a result of which, you know, in real life, women are beginning to think, well, yeah, they, they, can, they can stand up for themselves. They can do this and this. I don't need a man and so on. All of this is happening, right? The second thing, the cunning thing is happening is, is and this is, you know, I, I noticed this some time back with um, some of the characters that we have. Some of these characters that we've grown up with, children, as children we've grown up with, right? Which are traditionally standard classical male characters are being turned literally into women. Okay, I don't know if uh, you guys in America, I don't know if you have a character called Doctor Who? Yeah, we've, we have uh, him, yes, sometimes, yes. Right, Doctor yes, Who goes back all the way to 1960s. Uh -huh. 1960s, that's 50, 60 years of this character, right? Mm. And he's a time lord, he regenerates, etc. and always been a male character, but traditionally it's just, there's no doubt about it, that he's always a male character. You know what's happened to him in the last four or five years? No, I don't know. Three years, sorry. He changed into a woman. Oh, really? Doctor Who changed. Remember, he changed from one male actor to the next male actor uh, and uh, over the last 40, 50, 60 years, practically. In the last three years, they decided that he was now going to change into a woman. That's incredible because it's a male character. Yeah. They changed it into a woman. Now, that has a deep impact because if you look, 50 years, that's a lot of people that have grown up with this character. Now, what, what's the psychological impact of something you've grown up with suddenly changing into the opposite gender? That's what's happened there, mm. right? Then you've got characters in uh, other spheres. And um, again, looking at the superhero, which has been a very successful, very widely advertised, very successful. You've got your superheroes. You've got, for example, a character like Thor in the Avengers. Again, a very masculine character put out in three or four movies, very masculine character, very noble, very masculine, etc. Uh, I mean, uh, they're Viking mythology. So Vikings were very masculine. Mm. And he's now handed over the throne, so to speak, to a woman. Oh, okay. The throne of his kingdom to mm. a woman, which it, it's impossible in, in Viking law. It, it's not possible. <laughs> but he's handed over. And she... Is going, he calls her, you're going to be the new king. I won't be the king, he says, you're going to be the king. So she is now, as a king, she must now find a queen. So she finds a woman to be her queen. Oh. That's what's happened. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So a lot of this is going on, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing that I read in um, Summer Hoffman, well, one of the, it's called the, um, the War on Boys, the name of the book. And it talks about how Every single syndicated program on TV, the men are made to look dumb and the women are yeah. made to look smart. Yeah. So you have like Bart Simpson and the dad versus, you know, the mother. You have, for example, the Bill Cosby show yeah. uh, where the male figure is and, and the son, they're like dumber and the daughters are yeah. better. Yeah. You know, I love Raymond. You can go on and on on the list. And then um, in the movies, they when they do have the hero, he always has relationship problems, like with the parent or with, you know, yeah. uh, something like this. Anyway, the point being that uh, I remember talking to a convert and she said to me, I just thought guys were clowns. I mean, growing up, I just thought they were clowns until, uh, you know, when she became Muslim and she went to the masjid and she's like, oh, okay, guys do have a role in life. <laughs> yeah. You know, imagine being in a house where, you know, you don't have your dad, you only have your mom. And yeah. then you see a boyfriend come and go and it's like not really clear what his role is. And, yeah. and, and sometimes he pays for this and that and he's really nice, but you know, he's, he, he's, he's funny, but you're like, oh, okay, I guess, well, that's their job just to be a clown. Yeah. Yeah. This is where, as I was saying earlier about sisters, women tending to um, criticize the men is because of this dumbing down. That dumbing down is also impacting our, uh, the sisters who are thinking, OK, this is what men are like. And obviously you've, you've heard that firsthand. Right. And I'll tell you another thing that's happening in that uh, respect is that um, more and more Muslim sisters are beginning to enter the arena of the brothers work. They're starting to become more um forward 
in doing the brother's work, right? Now, Allah knows best, you know, may Allah reward them for that in, in the sense that he will, inshallah. But my point is, you know, because some of them are doing it out of desperation because the brothers aren't doing it, but that should not be happening. That is wrong, right? Because when a woman steps into a man's domain, she now has to deal with men. And she's, you know, if she's, you know, Alhamdulillah, she may be pious, righteous, says she sees a need, uh, she needs to go in there and solve it because the brothers aren't doing it, all well and good. But now she's going to deal with men. And a woman should be in a woman's domain, a man should be in a man's domain. Imagine if you like, if a man says, okay, I'm going to set up a network of mother and toddler groups, and I'm going to facilitate them and support them and train them and et cetera, and resource them. Anybody would say, you know, Sheikh, Molana, what are you doing working with women? Let sisters do that. That's a woman's job. Mm -hmm. Let sisters deal with sisters' roles and sisters' problems and sisters' so, issues. So when you put it like that, it seems very commonsensical, you can say, or yeah. good sense. That, yeah, you, you know, let the women handle their own issues, right? Yeah. And and let them deal with that. But but with when it comes to the men, it's almost like you're bad if you don't want women to come into the male domain. So it's like opposite almost going back to what i said didn't i say talking about manhood in its true sense without being politically correct just being honest is going to sound awkward it's going to be uncomfortable and that's yeah. what i'm saying to even have a discussion now this is how bad it is to even have a discussion about manhood in its true sense it makes people uncomfortable right and that's why this kind of discussion is difficult because this is in a sense it gives you also an idea of how well the opposition, if you like, has done the job. Mm. That even as Muslims, and that, this includes our sisters, our sisters and ourselves should be completely subservient to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the head of the household is the man, the husband, the father, khalas, there should be no argument in that. Did you see what I mean? However, yeah. because of modern um, influence, our sisters, and that's, just, that's the thing, I mean, when I talk about movies or media, that's a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar industry, right? Yeah. Now, they're not spending all that much money, to, uh, and it's not effective. It's very effective. It's very effective upon us, all of us. Mm -hmm. And it's all around us. So this is what's happening. Now, if you look at, um, if you look at say, the ayah in the Quran about marriage, right? Surah Nisa. Right, the is it second, third ayah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. yeah. All right. Yeah. Now let's just let's just let's just word this, right? Because the thing is, if you look at that, I mean, whenever we come to this issue of you know marriage and polygamy and so on, it's it's it becomes a very contentious issue, mm. right? And the way it's described by a lot of males is in a very negative sense. Yeah, let's look at the ayah. It says, Allah Ta'ala says, you know, marry the women of your choice, two, three, or four, and be just between, and if you cannot, then marry only one. You know, people tend to skate quickly to the end. And they say, ah, there you go. Allah Ta'ala said, marry only one, because you can't be just. No man yeah. can be just. It's not for anybody to do. So just marry one. Yes? Yeah. That's not what the verse says. You're completely ignoring 90% of what the verse says and jumping straight to the end of the verse. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you. And, and then, and then you'll have ulama, you know, touting all of that, which is incorrect. Because why are we forgetting Allah Ta'ala says marry two? Then he says marry three. Then he said marry four. Then he said be just between them. And if you can't be just, then marry one. The, the, the one was the last resort. Right? That's, yeah. that's one. We, we jump to the end. And everybody then screams out, yeah, you can't be just. Okay, if you can't be just, first of all, let, let me ask you something. In what sense does a man have to be just? Is it just between his wives? No, in just, just everything wives? in life. In everything in life, exactly. Yeah. So if he can't be just between his wives, it means he can't be just. It's period, yes? That's not in his nature. Justice is... Because if he can be just between his brothers, his sisters, his two parents, because we all have re relations that we have to be just between. For example, if I have three or four brothers and sisters, I could be just between all of them, yes? So I've already got that param parameter set. I've got already everybody's got two parents. You've got to be just between your two parents. Yes? Mm -hmm. You've got two sets of grandparents. So you've got to be just between four people there. You've got all your friends. You've got to be just between your friends. Etc. Et Do you see what I'm saying? You've got your yeah, children. Yeah, you. You've got to be just you. between your children. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You've got to be just between your children. 
So if you can't be just between two people, yeah, take out this idea about wives or anybody, just if you cannot be just between two people, then you're not a just person. Is that right? Yeah. So in that case, if you cannot be just between two wives, you can't be just between any two people. In that case, what should we do? If we go with the philosophy of the way people interpret this ayah, that you can only have one, it means you're going to get rid of all your brothers and sisters and just keep one. Get rid of all your children except one. Get rid of all your friends except one. Did you see what I'm get, getting right, at? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you follow the logic through, if I follow their argument through, which is not the argument Allah Ta'ala puts through, you see, that's why, because it's a human argument, it's, 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 it's foolish. Mm. So if you're going to if you got, if you're going to put this that you can't be just between three or four, you can only have one. Then that applies across the board in every single relationship you have, because you, you need you, justice is required in every relationship. So wherever justice is required, we have to fulfill this principle, which the people are talking about. So if your principle is that you cannot be just between two human beings, then you should only have one. In that case, you should only have one brother or sister. You should only have one child. You should only have one friend. Do you see what I'm saying? It goes like that. And that's that's yeah, when sure. you realize the foolishness of this interpretation. Secondly, the idea of getting married is to do with you, the man. It's your choice, isn't it? Right? The decision to get married is your decision. And the need for justice is on your shoulders. So if you let, again read this ayah, Allah Ta'ala is saying, if you, right, you marry two or you marry three, or you marry four, and you be just between them. And if you cannot be just between them, then you marry only one. Do you see I'm stressing the you? Yeah, yeah. How many times Allah Ta'ala say you in this ayah? Do you see? Yeah, 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 you're right, yes. So what's happening here? It's a direct address to the man. Hmm. Nobody in this verse has said, well, you've got to ask permission from your mother, Father, brother, sister, wife, son, daughter, friend, neighbor, imam, etc. Is it? Because Allah Ta'ala is talking to Rajul, a man. Yeah, by nature. And a man by nature, he can go seek, find, and uh, take on board in his life through Nikah, a woman. That's his nature. He has that strength. He has that determination. He has that courage. He has that wisdom. He has that balance. He does not need to seek permission, especially when the permission is given by Allah. Allah Ta'ala says, do this or this or this. If not, then this. That's between him and Allah. And Allah is addressing him with you, 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 you. Constantly. Throughout this entire ayah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, this makes people feel uncomfortable, doesn't it? It makes them feel uncomfortable. And then the sisters are going to say, well, you know, our husbands can hardly take care of us. Our, hard, our husbands hardly spend any intimate time with us why would they you know why would they uh so you have the so when the sisters are looking at the guys their their critique is partly correct because they don't see them being man enough and and then that exasperates this problem because okay uh, there's a saying there's a saying in the english language you may have heard of it be careful what you ask for you <laughs> just may get it Yes. Yeah. So if the sister's complaining he's not man enough, if we were able to suddenly switch him on and becomes man enough, now what? Yeah, I mean, then what? Yeah. Then what? And if you look yeah. at Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because this argument again, this argument is, is a foolish argument. It can be torn down. If they're saying that you know it's um, you know he, he's he's not able to spend, give me enough time, well, okay. So what does that mean? Right. I mean, he has other duties to do as well, but it's 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 something that can be easily resolved. Having said that, people say that, oh, the, the father doesn't give the children enough time. Doesn't give the parents enough time. There are parents wondering when my son's going to call me. So what do we do in that case? Is he no longer a father? Is he no longer a son? Is he no longer a brother? Mm. No, we said this is life. This is modern life. Because part of what we've got to be fair, we, we know the world is full of problems. We know lots of things are out of balance. So let's not confuse the issue, right? By bringing in things which are not relevant and trying to sort of squeeze them in there, right? Mm. The fact that the man is not giving you enough time, that's a matter that can be resolved and it's at an end time between any two people, two friends, two brothers, whoever, two neighbors, doesn't matter. That can be resolved, sit down, make some time, etc. But our lives are so in this day and age that, um, we, 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 we tend to find that we're lacking in many things, right? 
And I think that people have to be fair and just themselves, because this is an unjust argument, you see. You have to be fair and just say, okay, is he a good husband or not, right? And time division, etc., is a separate matter, okay? That can be resolved. Okay. Now, if you look again at this, um, what I was talking about, the, the sisters coming into the men's domain, I think that needs to be resolved as well in that case, because we've got sisters doing the work of brothers. Yeah. That shouldn't be happening because it, it impacts their haya. And I'll tell you something that uh, I've observed in some I mean, sisters. I can clearly tell you, say that uh, sisters probably do more Islamic work in the communities than the brothers do. There's various reasons for that, obviously, that sisters yeah, are more yeah. free, the brothers are working, et cetera, et cetera. But that's where the way things are evolving. And the Prophet said some of that the yeah. women would be one of the would be more attracted to this uh, the, the jazz, uh because of yeah. obviously what he has to offer is not look yeah. attractive, but yeah. it will be deceptive, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then what really um strikes me is the saying of the Prophet وسلم, that there will come a time where there'll be one man to 40 women in some place, maybe because of wars, because of whatever. Yeah. Uh, so women are going to have to learn after this feminism and the sexual revolution. It seems like not in the too far future. Uh, women are going to have to learn how to get along with the idea of polygamy because it's going to be a necessity, a necessity in the future. Yeah, I mean, think about this. I mean, that to, be, to me, the way I see that is actually a punishment. You see, for all this time, throughout human history, regardless of Islam, as you well know, polygamy was in practice. I mean, as Muslims, to be honest with you, we shouldn't even use this word polygamy. There's no such thing in Islam as polygamy. This word doesn't exist, okay? You can't find that word. What you'll find is nikah, right? Uh, marriage, you will not find polygamy. That's an English word because they like to compartmentalize things. They like to put things in compartments. That this is this much and this is the, the next level and this is the next level. In Islam, it's marriage. And marriage was seen as whether you had one, two, three, four wives, it was, you were married. Khalas. Mm. That was your family. The, 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 those, and many, many cultures still do that today. The Arab culture, you know, some cultures in Africa, etc. Even some non-Muslim cultures, right? The Amish people and so on. It's nothing. They don't, to us, we can't even speak about it. As soon as you start speaking, people start raising eyebrows, right? Uh, if we even start to talk, I've, I've seen imams uh, on the uh, question and answer session, somebody puts a question about polygamy and th there's this smirk or there's this hesitancy and we've got to be very careful what we're saying. But yeah. what's, the, what's, the, what's the result of that? You can see that around the world. The prostitution industry, the pornography yeah. industry, human trafficking, adultery, lesbianism even, okay? And widespread zina, all of that. Whereas if these women were somebody's wife, no man would touch them. And you know, only recently in the last, what, 100 years or so is when the West, and that's what our sisters have to understand, the West came in and made um, polygamy outlawed. Okay, and you have to marry one man. Well, here in America, you still have a whole state, Utah. Yeah. Where the Mormons, they get yeah. uh, married. I mean, the whole state, basically, yeah. they allow yeah. more than, I mean, they don't. Yeah. yeah. So I don't but know if it's legal they, status, they, but they allow. Yeah, the point is they, def they redefined marriage to be the union of one man to one woman. That's it. Prior to that, there was no definition. In fact, in the Bible, in the Torah, in the Gita, in the any religious book, you cannot find the definition of marriage. There's no definition. The only place you can find the mar marriage defined is in the Quran. Yeah, and in, in the in the subject of uh, uh, evolutionary psychology, they actually think that polygamy within the process of evolution is the norm because uh, you see, if you have ten guys and ten girls then not every guy is mature meaning there's the range from one girl to the other is uh very limited in terms of functionally female right but a guy uh there are 10 guys so let's say uh, like in the african-american community today um uh, 30 percent of them have been in jail 30 percent are jobless Sorry, Sheikh, you're breaking up a bit um okay so if you have, uh, let's say, 30% of your society that's actually mature men, 
Jeff, you why... wake up a bit. Okay. Can you hear me now? And now? Is it better now? Hello, Saliku. Sorry about that. Um, that's okay. We'll just fix it. So, um, so I was saying that, uh, you know, if you have 10 male, 10 females, evolutionary psychology would say not every guy, like in the animal world, there's one alpha male who takes all the uh, girls. So not all guys are marriage material or not the best marriage material. So, um, so if there's 10 guys, let's say three or four are marriage material, then why would the girl not have the option that she should marry into the better sperm, uh, to put it in evolutionary perspectives, or, or the better household, right? Mm -hmm. uh, wh why should she not have the right? Why, is she, why should she be stuck with someone who's not going to treat her as well and then throw her away in the streets, right? And I remember um, I was in, I think it was Iowa. I was in Iowa and I was invited by the university to talk about Islam. So they were interested in knowing about polygamy. So I decided to put this idea that I had read at that time to test, like practically. So I asked the women in the, in the campus, and I think somewhere online you actually have that speech or at least part of my speech from Iowa University somewhere there in the internet. But I asked the, the women, I said that there are some women here who've been in many relationships and all they want and all they care about is like, they don't, they're not looking for romance. You know, they have children, they've been through, you know, four or five relationships and yeah. they just want a stable guy, you know, yeah. they just want security. So I said, okay, how many of you women, if you, uh, you know, like I, I asked the, the audience, the sisters in the audience, non-Muslims mostly. Okay, so let's say there are some of you who have been through many relationships, you have children, you know, you're tired of this cycle of dating and marrying and divorce and over and over again. Would you just, may, would you like to, if you were given the option, look, this guy is stable, he's married, his children, he's a good father, he's a good husband. Would you just be happy just marrying him and be a second wife? 100% of the women said, yes, we would take that option. 100%. Yes. Because what the sisters don't understand is what some of these other sisters go through. Like when you, me and you were talking about human trafficking the other yeah. day, right? That how some of these women suffer. They, they don't do prostitution yeah. because they want to, right? They do prostitution because that's the only way they know how that's to survive. Right. You know? And, uh, and so... Uh, anyway, so uh, I think that uh, the only other thing I'll add, and then I'll, right. uh, is that uh, you know th there's this uh, PhD thesis uh, that was done in the University of Michigan, uh, and what they found out there about polygamy was, or poly polygamy, however, whatever you want to call it, is that the more women a man invests in, the more he'll actually respect them. Yes. So if you, and that's, you know, the guy's mentality, now, guy's mentality is he always loves his gadgets, right? He loves his cars, he loves his gadgets, he loves his PC, because whatever you put your guy is, whatever he invests himself in. Whatever a guy invests himself in, he will respect that. So if he has more than one wife, and he's sp and this is what Quran teaches in the very beginning, give them the mahr, right? So it's all about spending and stability and 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 uh, anyway. So yes, please carry on. I think another thing that's important here. Um, I just want to finish off my point. Actually, um, when we said, said about um, forty women to one man, I think that that is a stage where. As I said, traditionally, marriage has been limited from polygamy into monogamy, one man, the union of one man to one woman. As a result, women have become proliferated in these. And maybe this is a, a, a population control mechanism. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm there. saying is, as a result of that, us Muslims specifically, I mean, we have to admire the Amish and so on, but us Muslims should have been there first and said, no, this is our way of life. This is our way of life. Right. I mean, I have to admire um, 
uh, Ramzan Kadyrov, mm. the Chechen leader, mm. Mm. because the Russian law states one man to one woman. Mm. He made an announcement because Chechnya is like a small state within Russia. He said, as for us Chechens, yes, the Russian law states that, but he added, in the Quran, it states that we can marry two, three, or four. Wow, you see what I mean? Yeah. He said that. Alhamdulillah, right? And this is practiced in, amongst the Chechens. In the, I mean, you know, the Chechen people, mashallah, you know, they've shown true grit in standing up to a, a, a first world country twice yeah. over. Twice so that, over. Yeah, that's kind of like close to where uh, Khabib is from. So, yeah. you know, they're yeah. the same culture. Yes, that, that, that's, yeah, that's him as well, yeah. But my yeah. point is that, that, that that's these people, alhamdulillah. And um, but what I'm saying is, this is how we all around the world should have been. But as I say, it's it's very difficult and we haven't, and because we haven't defended it, the proliferation, even in our own Muslim countries, of the sex industry is immense. It's horrific. It should not be happening. And then on the other hand, you've got, for example, where I come from, Pakistan, that there's stories about... Uh, daughters who are not being able to get married and they're in their 30s, 40s, etc. It's happening here in England everywhere as well. You know, mm-hmm. we're sisters now, delivery, just not getting married. So 25, 30, they're not married, right? Some of them are yeah. not even thinking about it. But the point is that because there's there's not enough men to go around. But I think that this, this hadith about 40 women to one man is actually, apart from being a prophecy, I sense a punishment in it. Yes. You see, all along, we as Muslims, we should have been practicing this and it would have been okay, contained. Because we didn't, we didn't practice this, Allah Ta'ala then will put us in a situation, forty because obviously polygamy can't answer it now. Mm. If every man married for 40, it's just it's beyond. So that's a punishment. That you didn't do what you needed to do to protect the women, which Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam imagined is in his last nasiha. You know, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is about to pass away from the dunya. He's giving the last nasiha. What should he talk about? Well, I would say tawheed. I would say maybe, you know, the Salah, you would maybe, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, many of these issues. But he says, the women, look after the women. And he repeats this three times. He repeats it three times. And uh, he's, I leave them in your care. Mm. Take care of them. Take care of them. And this is the state we're in. And the, so I think this 40, hadith, uh, 40 to 1 is, is actually, it's, it's, a, it's a sign of punishment. Because mm. no man is going to be able to take care of four to women anyway. It's not going. To, it's not. So it's a punishment. It's a punishment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I've seen. I've seen scholars try to explain this away. It's, oh no, no. That that includes his wife, his one wife, and his daughters, and his sisters, and his aunts, and his grandmothers. And I mean, it's pathetic. It's pathetic, really. It doesn't mean that. How many men have forty women relationships? You know, uh, uh. ridiculous. No, 40, because the hadith that says that there will be 40 women following him, following yeah, along for with refuge. him. Yes, yes, yes. And not just that, even if he has, okay, if, if it's, let's just, I have 40 women, I have one wife, but I have 39 mahrams. For example, grandmothers, daughters, sisters, etc. Well, who's going to marry them? There's still a problem for the next man. So this way you can tell, these human arguments are foolish when measured up against the Quran and the sunnah, the practice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes. But going further to this, in terms of manhood again, another area that impacts is, is just this now, as we're touching upon it, is the <coughs> ulama and the Muslim sense of ghayra to be able to defend and uphold the traditional understanding and practice of his deen. Mm. That is being weakened. Mm. I mean, I once asked a sheikh, and I have to respect him for this, I said to him, sheikh, could you do a talk on polygamy? Mm. You know what he said to me? It's very profound. I, I, I value what he said. He said, to me, Molana, I can't do a talk on polygamy because I've not practiced it. And I will not speak about it unless I do, because it takes a man who's done it, been there, done that, to talk about it. And you're so right. Mm. Because that's what a lot of the sheikhs who do talk about this, they have never practiced it. And it's a basic principle in knowledge that when you speak about a matter, it should be because you've been there, done that. Mm. You have experience of it. Majority mm. of these peaks, and, and the other, the, which then the, begs the question, okay, Sheikh, lead by example. Why don't you get married again? And immediately, there'll be laughing, sniggering, embarrassment, a joke about the wife, etc. But all of which it really encapsulates what? Weakness, lack of manhood. That's what it means, really, seriously. Okay? Because he should be able to go out there and first of all, your first wife, the one you married, should have been someone who's a practicing pious Muttaqi sister who understands it like this and says, yes, 
that's your right. It's not my. It's not for me to speak in this matter. I am your wife. So long as you are still my husband and fulfilling my rights, Alhamdulillah, the rest is your choice and your decision. That's a submissive woman. Mm. Submissive, not to him, by the way, not to him, to Allah, saying that this is the nazam of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Who am I to question it? This is the order that he's putting. Exactly. In place. That is the when Allah Taala says that about righteous women that they are kanitat. Etc., right? That it talks about the righteous women are those who are obedient, obedient and submissive and understanding to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is upon you and me as well. We, we, we have to, uh, in terms of the hukum upon us to be good to our women, to our sisters, our daughters, etc. Yes, we, we are, but all of us ultimately have to submit to the law of Allah ta'ala. As Rasulullah said, and even in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala says that it is not, for, not right for a believing man or a believing woman to have a say in a matter when Allah and his Rasul have decided that matter. Yes, it is not right for a believing man. It's stressed on the believing, the non-believing or the half-believing or the weakly believing. Yeah, they'll have a lot to say. But Allah Ta'ala says for the believing man or the believing woman is not right for them to have a say in a matter when Allah and his Rasul have decided that matter. It's done. So these issues are done with, and but we spend hours speaking about them. There are so many videos and talks and lectures you can find about these things, but the result of it is nobody does it. Nobody does it, and the impact of that is the sex industry and the, the zulm being done upon women. The zulm is it's women, who, it's women who speak out against it, and it's the women who then have to face the consequences of it, and they mm. don't seem to realize, hang on, I'm causing my own problem. I'm practically digging my own grave here. Mm. Then you've yeah. got the weakness of manhood also, then as I, in our shuyukh, many things are happening. For example, and this is similar to what I've just been saying, but I went to a meeting, was, you know when this sex education issue happened in schools? It's going back last year, year and a half now. Mm. And coming into the situation in England, we had this protest in Parkfield School. I think, you know, all of you must have seen that by now, right? Uh, the protest outside the school, Muslims standing outside the schools, protesting about the, the LGBT and so on. Oh, okay. And we had a meeting and I was called to this meeting in, in my city, Birmingham, in uh, England. And I was told that this is a specialized meeting and it's only with the 13, 14 brothers who are the most active brothers in the deen. Mm. And we want you to go there as well. And I thought, subhanAllah, you know, I mean, I, I didn't feel that I was such, you know, I was um, among such company, but I was invited and I thought, okay, I'll go. I went there, went to this meeting. We sat down. There was that 13, 14 of us, mashallah. And I recognized the faces. There were leaders of masjids and organizations and so on. And then they talked about this event. And the whole meeting was about how to resolve this. And they talked about this protest outside Park, uh, Parkfield School. And mm. how it was two sisters, two mothers that actually started this off. Mm. One of them said, one of the men said, MashaAllah, we need more sisters like this. <laughs> yeah. And everybody seemed to cheer that on. Yeah. I felt angry and disgusted. I didn't say anything to him because everybody was in agreement, mashallah. But I thought to myself, how shameless that a man should say we need more sisters like that oh so you're happy with your wives or sisters standing out so protesting in the public eye and there's no men in sight this is you're happy and you want more sisters like that what you should have said is those sisters shouldn't have been there we should have been there we should have been in their place number one and we need more brothers like that but you see this is part of our weakness our to such an extent is our masculinity diminished that we even speak and think and act in a weak manner, in a bi-ghairat manner, mm. right? That, that, that's an that's issue of ghaira. Would Omar Farooq have said something like that? He would have probably whipped that man. <laughs> this is not the way it to talk. It reminds me of one of Iqbal's poems uh, where he says ghairat, uh, uh, he says something like, you know, when the ghairat left, he was talking about his time, the Muslims of his time, the ghairat yes. left. So you don't even realize that it's not there, right? It just becomes normative to live yeah. without ghira. Exactly. And this is uh, what's happening. Men are becoming weak and talking like this, and it's become the culture. I mean, so, now the culture is, you know, when I do uh, marriage counseling, the brother, they're not shy, like, to say, okay, like, uh, so you're going to be working, right? 
<laughs> like I understand that if somebody's situation is that way, then you know, then that's the situation. But uh, it, nowadays, it's like almost like the guy is earning good, and then he still wants his wife to bring in her share of the of yeah. the income. Which Islamically, that's also a problem because he's supposed to be spending on her, and she can keep hers. Technic yeah. Technically, Absolutely. so we got that on the one side, yeah. and then on the other side we have the economic system that's very unjust, and so two people have to work. So you have a lot of righteous people, who uh, well, um, when you say about this, two people have to work. To be honest with you, I mean, I mean that that's another topic. Maybe some other time we can talk about it. It's called zohud. Okay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's called yeah. zohud. zohud yeah. Taqwa and zohud. People, if you look back at the time of the salaf, right, Sahabia married Sahaba who had no more than perhaps a steel ring to offer. Okay? Yeah. I mean, again, like I said, our mentality is different. We can't imagine this. You know the story of the Sahabiya, she came to the, the gathering of the Salaf, the Sahaba, and she proposed herself to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at that time, you know, he, he, not, he, he, he uh, turned it down. But look at this. First of all, it shows, you know, there's many things to learn from this, but how uh, they, they, they always aimed for the highest the best man available, going back to your earlier point, they picked the best man available, not the man with the most wealth, but the one who's going to get them to Jannah, the one who is richest in the heart with his deen. As Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, picked for, with the women as well, don't go for the beauty, the lineage and the, the, the nasab, but go for her deen, right? So here's, she's doing that. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned it down. So what does she do? She sits down. This means she's, 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 she's got her dignity. She sits down. She doesn't say, no, I want to get married. She sits down. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi understands that this is her dignified way of saying, I am came here to get married to the best man I can. If not, then marry me to somebody else of your choice. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam understood that. So he then said, is there any man here who's able to marry this sister? So a Sahabi says, I will marry her. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what can you give her for dowry? He said, I don't have anything. So Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, is there anything? You don't, have, you don't have this, this? He says, no. Do you even have a steel ring? He says, I might have a steel ring. Says, okay, I marry you to her on the basis of steering. Now she could have said, no, mm. I don't want a steering. I want an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> but she accepts it, right? And there, 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 there are many stories like this of, of uh, Sahaba was so poor, Sahabi was so poor, etc. But Zahab, you live with the basic needs that you need. And today is the same thing. If you live with the basic needs, you can, you can, you can get by. You don't need the wife to work. You can maintain your ghaira because you say, okay, for example, Allah Ta'ala has given us one pair of feet. And that's absolutely true. We, we, we have, you're, you're, we have 12, if if yeah, there's Zohar, they shoes. can do with one income. Yeah, we have 12 pairs of shoes when Allah has given us one pair of feet. You see? We, we have clothes in the wardrobe hanging there that we're hardly going to use there for a rainy day, which could be looking good on the backs of Syrians and other refugees because they're, they're going to stay in your wardrobe for a year. Yeah? And again, like I said, people get uncomfortable. But th this is this is the reality. If we lived, and that again takes himmat, takes the ghayra of a man to stand for his deen and say, this is what my deen says. I am here as your husband. I'm supposed to provide for you clothing. Here, here's two sets of clothing. That's all you need. Here's two pairs of shoes. That's all you need. Here's food. I'll make sure you are fed three times a day. I'll make sure there's a roof over your head. I'll make sure, do you see what I mean? These are the things that are required. And a, a believing woman will say, I'm happy with that. Put me inside a cardboard box so long as it's you that I'm married to. Because you're a man of Jannah. Do, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now, anything beyond that, obviously, is, is extra and he can do that for her. But my point is that when a woman like that comes along and a man come, like that comes along, that is what they call the law of attraction. That's when those two people are correct for each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? yeah. What you find is, is, I want this and this and this before we even got married. Then you wonder where all the expenses are coming from. Much of what we uh, spend is actually, it's, it's, it's what's called Beo uh, it, it's It's extra, extravaganza. We don't with what's to... coming in the future, we better get used to it. Exactly. And this again is that that's where there's a, a punishment and a, 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 a reminder in this. There's a tarbiya in this lockdown that we are now being made to understand this is what we need. We didn't need all those other things. And a lot of people are realizing that with this lockdown as well. We didn't need all those things. Mm. You know? And this, again, case, takes ghayra. To be strong in the deen, this is a part of it, right? Allah Ta'ala says that the better is the strong believer because your strength of belief is going to make you not compromise and not become distracted and say, okay, I'll have this and I'll have that. You know, there's Muslim homes with kids have a TV in each bedroom. 
do we need that? I mean, there's no, there's a question whether we need the well, TV as well not, yeah. itself, but yeah, yeah? everybody's yeah. got a phone. Everybody's got a phone. Is that necessary? Right? So these are the things that we, we need to, if we're strong with that a sense of later, we, we can be better in our deen. Now, I don't want to leave this without, because people always say, okay, what's the solution? There are some solutions, okay? Um, one simple solution, which I see a complete lack of, going back to our being overweight and so on with the food and so on, is exercise. Intense exercise will increase your testosterone. Mm -hmm. You notice majority of Muslims don't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah? It's almost zero across the ulama, yeah. and it's very minimal across the ummah. Mm. And if somebody does do it, they'll do it because they want, you know, it's a bodybuilding thing or whatever it is, and it's done out of uh, uh, for, for for showing off, which is makes it incorrect. But my point is, we should have a regular, disciplined attitude towards doing exercise. Once you do that, and then you need to get in the gym, because when men get together and they're all you're pushing that weight and it hurts as it tears your body, because that's how muscles build, you release testosterone. And then when you're in the presence of men doing that, one another, it, it's, it, there's, there's this atmosphere. Mm. And we need to start doing that. We need to generate that. Mm. Right. Um, I'm sure you guys have got some of these old boxing gyms. And if you go into there, you see these guys, young guys who are in there boxing and so on, training hard. And there's this atmosphere in there. It's electric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah? It's yeah. very masculine. Yeah. It's very masculine, right? Brothers need to do this. Our people, our ulama specifically, we need to do this. The, the fact that we have obesity, we have fat in our bellies, that is decreasing our testosterone, that is impacting us. That's impacting our nature, right? That we need to get rid of. If you look at Shamal Tirmidhi, which is a description of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his, his personality, his character, his, literally his body. What does it say about his body? It says his it's chest ripped. was in line with his stomach. It ripped. Yeah? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it I mean, sounds like it was ripped because it says yeah, you can see days, each body those... part separately from the other. Yeah, yeah. In those days, they didn't have that language of six pack. But the point is, in, in, the, in the language of Shamal Tirmidhi, it says his chest was in line with his stomach. How many people, Muslims, can can claim that, that your chest is in line with your stomach, meaning your stomach is flat? Right. How many of us? And this is again, and as I said, it, it impacts a lot of things. Imagine now a lot of brothers and sisters are looking for spirituality. Right. So they want to find a share to give bayah to who can guide them spiritually, yes? Mm. How are you going to give bayah to a share whose stomach is sticking out? If he hasn't got control over his own nafs, over his own diet and food, how is he going to get you to rectify your nafs? His nafs has overpowered him. And many of these spiritual sheikhs, so-called, are like that. And if you look at the traditional shiur from Imam al-Ghazali rahmatullah to Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jalani rahmatullah Shawali Allah rahmatullah etc. They were nothing of the kind. Mm. And I've done this. I've searched for a long time. It's been maybe 10 years, seriously, to find a sheikh that I can give bayah to. And first and foremost, my first criteria is his physical <laughs> appearance. <laughs> Sorry, but that's a reality. Yeah. That's a reality because Imam Ghazali Rahmatullah talks about this. It spends a lot of time in his Ihyalumuddin talking about food and its negative impact on people and mm. to stay away from such people who are basically like animals, mm. right? That they mm. just live for food. And um, so I want to share who's at least got the basics down because I need mm. him to be better than me. He can't lead me if he's not better than me. And that's yeah. why that's the criteria, isn't it? Whenever you find a teacher, he's got to be better than you. <laughs> So if he's being impacted by his fat and he's decreasing his testosterone and it's also showing his own, I'm sorry, but the word is greed with food, then I cannot give him bayah. He cannot give me anything spiritual. Do you see the impact of manhood? It's really wide. I could talk about a lot of things, right? The impact of manhood, because the first thing Allah Ta'ala created when he created Adam was a man. He put in, in, in him manhood, mm. right? And a Khalifa is a leader and a leader can only be a man because the nature of a man is the basis of leadership. Mm. And if you don't have that nature, you don't have that strength, that courage. All leaders throughout history have had courage to do what they needed to do. That's why they've got up to do it. There's a very famous saying. Uh, it's a comparison between uh, Arab and Japanese. I don't know if you've heard this one. Um, but there's, a, there's an Arab saying that um, if one man can do it, let him get on with it. 
if no one does it, why should I do it? Mm. That's the Arab one. The Japanese version, if one man can do it, I can do it. Oh, wow. If no one does it, I must do it. Wow. See the, see the difference? Yeah. Yeah? That's manhood. And throughout history, be it the Ambiyal Islam, be it anybody, even, even the negative people, from Genghis Khan to Malcolm X, whenever a man stood up, he went against the flow of society, one man stood up. And before, he, by the time he's finished, he's got a whole flow going in that direction. He's impacted mm. the community. Mm. Yes? Yeah. That man is a man because it takes courage, determination, mm. discipline. Right? Yeah, that's the description given of Fatua in Surah Al-Kahf. إِذْ قَامُوا فَقَالُوا رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَاءِ When they stood up, yeah. right? And they showed that courage in right. front of the king. Right. Then, then they became men, so to say. Right. <laughs> Right. So this is what I'm saying that, you know, we have to have that understanding. And I know you've had various guests who've touched upon this subject. Sheikh Umar Zaid has said a lot about this when he talked about, you know, relationships. and We can't say enough about this because this is the key to the future. Yeah. This but is the key to the to the to the army of the Mahdi. This is the key. Yeah. yeah. Because this is where things will have to go back. Yeah. Yeah. But we've got to be careful about this because we've got lots of uh, there's the, the, the negative side of this is that we've got a lot of motivational videos on YouTube. And you can see that where they talk about, you know, all these uh, motivational talks, Denzel Washington and people like this and going on about, you know, you can do it and you can do anything you want and you're great and you're wonderful and so on. That's the other side of things. That's going beyond. You've got to maintain your humility. You've got to understand that I am ultimately a creation of Allah Ta'ala. And this was observed by the Romans when the Romans sent spies into the Muslim camps of the Sahaba because they wanted to know how the, what these people were like they were, when they were at war with them. They came back and they made a report to the uh, Caesar and they said, we can't defeat these people. We, we, we don't understand them. By day, they are like lions on a horseback. Yeah. By day, they are like lions on horseback. By night, they're like women weeping in their prayer. We mm. can't understand them. <laughs> Subhanallah. Yeah, but that was the nature of a man, the true nature, the God-given nature, which was that you had your strength and uh, uh, determination and discipline against the enemies of Allah, but at the same time, in front of Allah, you collapsed. Mm. You knew you were nothing. Whereas these videos, they don't give you that. They tell you, oh, you're this and you're that, and you can That's do whatever you want. That's uh, interesting. Iqbal, in his uh, Majlis Ashura, Iblis ki Majlis Ashura, yeah. he makes a similar point in a different way. He says, Mullah, uh, the, the, the ulama today, they only know sujood. They don't know qiyam. So, you know, the, the qiyam is how you start and then you go into. So this like balance, right? Between yes. sta standing before Allah. I mean, yes. that's a courageous act in itself in some ways. Yes. But he, he, his point was that to be on your feet uh, and, uh, and then to have sujood. So he said that we left our qiyam and now we're just in sujood. And we don't know how to do qiyam anymore. Yeah. So anyway, so... Uh, so, as I say, exercise is one thing. And another thing, cut down on the food. Seriously. Cut down on this... Olema specifically should not be eating junk food. Pizzas, burgers, all this stuff. It's, it's a reality, right? Apart from the issue whether it's halal or haram, right? As I said, it's got this fact. We know this. It's there. It's decreasing our masculinity. We should have nothing to do with it. Eat from the barakah of your wife's food or your mother's food, mm. right? Eat from the barakah of their food, but do not go out and do, do this. It's not correct, really. Um, mm. we, we need, and again, it's, it makes people feel uncomfortable, but if you want to be a man, you've got to do these things. You've got to stand out in your own comfortable sphere and get uncomfortable there, right? Start there, start small, start simple, but that's how you do it. Start to develop your attitude and have every day an amount of time or space where you do muraqaba, you reflect upon your character, reflect upon how you interacted with the people that you did in the day and observe yourself. How am I coming across? Am I coming across as a man or am I coming across as something less than that? Mm. And these are two, three things that, you know, I mean, there's more, but you know, time limiting, I suppose. But I would suggest that people start to do this. And we can do this together. We can organize, I mean, these, with, with Zoom, people can do exercise you know, on Zoom with uh, all together, you know, different in their own homes, etc. But we need to do this. This is really seriously important because mm. we are mm. being impacted by the negative and we are doing little to nothing in, in defense of it. 
Mm. And all these problems that we have, even this, you know, what we've got, like you, what you say, we can't even mention on YouTube now, right? But yeah. <laughs> what does it take? You know for yourself, we, we, we set up meetings with people and how many attended, apart from me and you, yeah. right? Yeah. People are afraid even to have their, uh, the video up uh, for public release. This is how afraid we were. Is this the character of a man? Mm. Right? Fear doesn't come into it. You fear only Allah. And when you behave like that, then you'll be respected by women, you'll be respected by men, you'll be followed by them. Yeah. Okay, mashallah. Uh, I think we still have a lot more to discuss. So we'll have, inshallah, if you don't mind, another session. Inshallah. And uh, and then, um, inshallah. So any last words? So I think uh, the most important thing, in a sense, you said is definitely eat less, right? And you made a very beautiful point about Ahya al -Mudin. Those are like uh, very important chapters. And in fact, Imam Ghazali says to eat, you know, if you eat, uh, to eat two times a day uh, or, yes. or less. Yes. And so... Um, That's the diet of the mu'min, by the way, to eat yeah. twice. You know, this I'm very sure you have made this point that they asked uh, the Salaf about the diet of the person who eats once a day. And the answer was, that is the diet of the uh, Anbiya al Islam. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. What about the person who eats twice a day? That is the diet of the Mu'min. What about the person who eats three times a day? Yeah, they said, get a pig's trough and that's let right. him feed. Yeah. yeah? yeah Subhanallah. Right, yeah. And it's true, actually, historically. Do you know that? Yeah. Historically, human beings didn't eat three, four times a day. This was done because of the Industrial Revolution in the West. The West did this they imposed in fact when they came over to america and uh, annihilated the red indians right part of what they did to them was impose they found them eating twice a day they imposed upon them a third meal mm. they literally imposed upon them because they wanted them to work for them and even here in england and the west they had this dinner time which is inserted normally it's breakfast in the evening but they inserted the dinner time to give people energy because they were working through the day and they needed energy to continue for the afternoon's work mm. having done the morning's work mm. It's not sunnah. Three times yeah. a day is actually not sunnah. No, three times a day is, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, I used to, long time ago, have three times a day. But now, alhamdulillah, my whole family, the whole family, Subhanallah. we just have breakfast and dinner. That's it. Subhanallah. Yeah. yeah. I mean, take, take Ramadan. Ramadan is the most pious, uh, at the time for the most piety. How many times do we eat? Twice. Yeah. That says something. Yes. And nowadays you have these workout people saying you should eat five times a day or keep eating a little by little by little throughout the day. You probably heard these things. But in the end, everything, uh, in the end, the, the, the science comes back to the sunnah of the Prophet. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So thank you so much for coming. Inshallah, um, maybe next week or the week after we'll have another session. Inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Inshallah. As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as-salam.